Climate change and, and the EU's approach on it is the first multinational, coherent, coordinated approach to dealing with resource use and resource allocation. Uh, we've got quite a way to go, but you know, it's absolutely essential that we try and make it work. At the moment, I think a lot is revolving around whether the Council can be persuaded to move to 30% as a commitment um, at its next meeting in the spring. Uh, and as you've just heard at the meeting that we've just had with the opinion that we've just discussed, we really have come into line with the other uh, institutions that have expressed a view on that Committee of the Regions and the Parliament. So um, I think we all now have a common front that we should be moving towards that uh, higher target uh, setting. We're trying to reflect um, civil society's voice into the institutions of the EU. Um, we're the only body that does that directly. And it's quite interesting that uh, public opinion is probably further in advance of political opinion on this particular one. Uh, so we try and encourage our members, and this is the role of uh, particularly people in Group 3 who, who reflect environmental interests, but also many people from the unions and from business as well, um, to, to, if you like, conduct a sort of educational and, and informational campaign so that we can strengthen the EU's underlying approach to issues of climate change. My view is that if you make the commitment, then you work out uh, the way of getting there that will still maintain the sort of growth and competitiveness that is necessary. Um, if you don't make the commitment, the incentive isn't there to do it. Now, we have excellent research facilities, we have a very developed industrial base here, uh, we, we have a, still a lead in uh, green R&D in Europe um, and we need to reinforce that. So I think we're quite capable of establishing uh, green carbon reduction type industries in Europe that will achieve the 30% and at the same time put us in a competitive position in the global market which is actually moving towards that view as well. D the dilemma that we have as an institution is in fact that over the last uh, 30 years in particular, certainly since the, the bodies were set up 50 years ago, um, lobby groups not only on the business side but also with the NGOs and civil and community organisations have developed massively. So very often they go directly to the Parliament, to the Commission and so on. Uh, they see less use for our role. What they don't realise is that we operate in a planned, constructive, systematic way to look at key issues that, all the key issues in fact, that civil society are involved with. So uh, I think part of our role in the ESC is to convince or reconvince civil society and institutions within civil society uh, who have their own lobby groups and, and pressure groups and so on that we are an excellent vehicle for getting views across. At the moment that isn't recognised but we can actually provide that sort of forum for debate and are open to civil society organisations not only visiting us, not just the usual tour around the buildings, but actually participating in debate. We use a lot of experts in our opinions uh, and we have specialist hearings and all those sorts of things. There are real opportunities within the committee for civil society itself to get involved and to get engaged and make their voice heard. Mm -hmm.